Good evening and welcome to a very special interview show of the Pro. The so-called issue of Khalistan is once again in discussion in the Indian media after the cowardly attack on the Indian High Commission in the UK. Joining me today to discuss the issue of Global Khalistan Project is someone who has covered this uh, issue since decades, Terry Mileski, a veteran Canadian journalist who reported from 52 countries during four decades as a television news correspondent for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, popularly known as CBC. Terry has uh, also written a very insightful book titled Blood for blood that takes a close look at the global Khalistan project, its hunger for revenge and the feeble response of India's Western allies. He traces the rise and fall of the diaspora militants like uh, Talvinder Singh Parmar, the Vancouver waste founder of the Babar Khalsa terrorist group and the man behind the 1985 Kanishka bomb plot which killed 329 abroad Air India Flight 182 passengers. Uh, the book provides startling uh, new information about the Khalistan movement in Canada, the United Kingdom and, and India, which has been sustained for decades by Pakistan and now threats, threatens to draw in China. The book has been published by the HarperCollins and the link to the book is attached in the description box below. So do check it out. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your time and a very warm welcome to the show. I would like to begin the discussion by asking that, that what was your motivation behind writing this book? Um, my motivation really was a, a sense of shame. Uh, which isn't usually what uh, writers say, uh, but I had by accident be, been uh, assigned to covering uh, the Air India bombing story. Uh, when it happened, I went to Ireland uh, and met some of the victims' families who were there. Um, and then I was also assigned to the criminal trial in Vancouver many years later, which ended uh, in 2005, and then it just happened that I was assigned to the judicial inquiry. Um, both the criminal trial and the inquiry went on for four years, so a total of eight years of testimony, uh, gigabytes of data on my hard drive, all the documents, all the evidence that was laid out in public, and which no, you know, nobody outside the uh, the circle of nerds who were following this ever read. Uh, and I, I came to realize that this had been um, grossly mishandled, to put it mildly, uh, by my country, Canada, uh, and that um, uh, we all owed something to the victims' families, uh, with whom I'd become friends over the years, many of them, uh, in terms of if we couldn't give them at least a full measure of justice, which is a tall order in, in any such case, uh, at least we could uh, tell the truth. Uh, it, if we couldn't get justice, we might be able to get an explanation, is one way to put it. Uh, and so I wanted to write about uh, what I had learned about the failure, the dual failure of Canada to prevent the bombing in the first place and to punish the bombers in the second place. Also, sir, how do you see the recent uh, cowardly attack on the Indian High Commission in London and whom do you hold accountable for the same? Who all are the stakeholders, according to your analysis, if you have uh, been following the following issue? Yeah, I, I, ha I have watched that. Um, and I must say first um, that uh, Indians uh, are rightly sensitive about this attack uh, and particularly about the tearing down of the Indian national flag. Uh, this is an abomination uh, for many Indians, but uh, I, I must say that London's seen a lot worse demonstrations than that. It was not the burning down of the Indian High Commission. It was a long way short of the worst that London has seen over the years. The Metropolitan Police in London have seen many much bigger demonstrations and protests, many more violent protests. This ranks very highly, in other words, and I'm not saying it should not, in Indian minds, a little less so in British minds, where, you know, they've seen it all before. Uh, and, and this, uh, on the scale of uh, attacks on embassies, uh, ranks... Uh, pretty low, frankly. Uh, so they, they don't take it quite as seriously as uh, the Indian side. You also ask who's responsible for this. Uh, I think there has been, uh, as most Indians will know by now, uh, a resurgence or an attempted 
resurgence, let's put it that way, of the Khalistan movement, driven by uh, a lot of misinformation and, frankly, disinformation. Uh, that is not a mistake. It's a deliberate mistake uh, by uh, Khalistanis in the diaspora. Uh, you don't see this in Punjab, where it matters, where most of the world Sikhs live, uh, but you do see it in the diaspora, principally in Canada, uh, secondarily in the UK, and then also Germany, Italy, uh, Australia. They're, attempt they're holding their referendum on independence now. Uh, you see a resurgence, and this is what that's about. It's about uh, anger uh, at India driven by stories, and I say it's disinformation, it's, it's deliberate lies uh, about how uh, allegedly, well, I, I, I'll quote the head of Sikhs for Justice, for example, that's the organization which, as you know, is running the referendum, the so-called referendum all over the world, uh, Gurpatwan Singh Parun, uh, who said as recently as last month uh, that uh, uh, what's behind all of this is the fact that, as he puts it, uh, Sikhs have been suffering an ongoing genocide at the hands of the Indian state from the time of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi right up to the time of Narendra Modi. And, you know, you have to ask, you know, which, which genocide is that? It's been going on all of that time? Uh, and and how, how come, you must ask, how come the millions of Sikhs in Punjab don't seem to have noticed this genocide? You'd think they'd be up in arms about it, but they're not. And that's, of course, because it's fiction. There have been terrible massacres. There's no doubt about it. 1984 is unforgivable. It's a stain on Indian history. It can never be wiped clean. But to say that there's been an ongoing genocide since the 1960s, I mean, it's just nonsense. Uh, it isn't true. But these truths have begun to take root. They're easy and cheap to spread now that everyone with a keyboard can be a great Khalistani warrior, not under his own name, of course, but uh, <clears throat> using a pseudonym, an alias, they can pretend to be angry at India over these pretend uh, massacres, and uh, they can be heroes. Uh, they can get street cred within their gang by being uh, re really tough on India, a real revolutionary. Uh, and it's working. We are losing, you and I and the Indian people and the Canadian people and the British people are losing the battle in cyberspace. They're doing a better job than we are. We've been passive, we've let it go. We say, oh, well, they, you know, they have freedom of speech. Well, they do. I'm in favor of their freedom of speech. I'm even in favor, although the most Indians don't like it, a referendum, which I think they will lose spectacularly. If you let them have it and they lose it, you kind of made your point, haven't you? You've won that battle. But uh, instead, it's no ban it, criminalize it, <clears throat> give them an excuse for failing. Uh, so um, it's a long answer, but you asked who was responsible. And I think the disinformers and the, uh, the Sikh diaspora principally in Canada and in the UK, are responsible for the attack on the British, uh, on the High Commission in London. Uh, but I think that India has, in a way, picked the wrong target. It's, it's, it's great for Indian politicians uh, to appeal to their voters at home by beating their chests and say, well, oh, it's terrible, you know, why doesn't Canada, why doesn't Britain, why don't they crack down, why don't they lock up these Khalistanis well, that, that probably looks good on Indian TV. But the Western democracies are not going to abolish freedom of speech. We're not going to lock them up for saying Khalistan is in Nabat. That's not illegal. What India should be aiming at, they should be more subtle, more sophisticated. Uh, they should be fighting back in cyberspace. They shouldn't be sitting back and saying, well, that's, that's just Twitter. That's just Facebook. That's just Telegram. That's just, you know, and just ignore it all, which is, which is mostly what they do. That is a mistake because that's where you're losing the battle and you're not fighting. You're not fighting back. You're making noise at British politicians. They're not the enemy. They're not the enemy. They didn't attack the High Commission. You need to attack the hearts and minds problem 
in the whole Sikh diaspora where people are, are being allowed to get away with vicious libels against the Indian people and the Indian state. Yeah. So uh, do you think that the deep states of countries like Canada and UK are involved in any sort uh, in providing uh, support to the uh, Khalistanis? I think it's inactive uh, support. By that, I mean that they're looking away. They're saying to themselves, as they do in Canada, most notably, well, look, uh, these Khalistanis, you know, they've taken over a lot of the Gurdwaras. Uh, they seem to have, a, a, you know, a, the most active following come election time, and they're offering to vote for me. And all I have to do is uh, go to the Vaisakhi parades and smile and wave as floats go by in the parade, uh, festooned with the colorful pictures, garlanded in gold tinsel, of gun-toting martyrs, so-called, of the Khalistan cause, to include the Air India bomber, Tovinda Palma, the assassins of Indira Gandhi, the assassins of General Vaidya, and on and on and on. Who the, uh, mass murderers, in other words, who are being glorified uh, publicly. I mean, it, it is absolutely obscene. Uh, to imagine, m m many Indians perhaps don't know this. You know, this is a routine thing. I mean, they have a permanent, life-sized, full-color, heroic picture of Tovinda Palma, Canada's worst ever mass murderer, the architect of the Air India bombing. They have that picture up permanently on the outside of a very important Gurdwara in the second largest city in, in British Columbia, in Surrey, B.C. And nobody says boo. Um, yeah. I do, a uh, few of my friends do, uh, and, and quite a few Sikhs do, but they don't want, like to do it in public because it can make life hard. You can be denounced and attacked. Maybe your business will be boycotted. It's not ple better to stay out of it. That's on the side, uh, the, the majority of the Sikhs who want nothing to do with this Khalistan nonsense. They want yeah. nothing to do with it. We're talking about a tiny minority which has hijacked a few key Gurdwaras and which have managed to get politicians to, as I say, look the other way in return for votes. If you sing my song, you know, we'll bring 10,000 people out to vote for you at election time. And I'm talking about all parties, by the way. It happens that the liberals in power, they're certainly guilty of this, but don't absolve the conservatives or the NDP, which is led by a longtime Sikh activist, Jagdeep Singh, yeah. Uh, who now holds the balance of power in the Canadian Parliament. So uh, uh, it's it's significant. Uh, so I think that uh, if this is a long way short. What I'm saying to you now is a long way short of uh, the the state in either Canada or the UK or anywhere else actively take, taking part in promoting Khalistani propaganda. They're not doing that. They don't have to. They just have to let it happen. And that is what they're doing. Yeah. So uh, we would like to hear about your experiences covering the Global Khalistan Project. And have you ever got threatened by these so-called Khalistanis during any part of your coverage uh, of the various terror activities uh, related to Khalistan? Uh, routinely. Um, and for many years. Um, I should say first that the people who are a lot easier to intimidate uh, and who get uh, death threats as well. And I'm more or less, I'm in many ways uh, sort of protected, I guess, because if I'm attacked, everyone knows who it's going to be. Because I've been on television for decades now talking about this issue. Everyone knows <clears throat> who my enemies are and might want to come after me. Uh, so it's, I, I'm not a very tempting target in that respect because uh, immediately everyone will figure out uh, who went after me. But uh, it, it has been uh, an irritant, let's put it that way, nevertheless, um, for many years. It used to be a very crude sort of thing. The, the dawn of the internet, they, you know, when chat rooms were very popular, they put things like, 
it's Milevsky's turn. Bullets are cheap, you know. Or uh, another one said, we should find out where Milevsky lives and put his head on a stick. So pretty basic stuff, that kind of thing. Um, and um, more recently, they've got, uh, I should say, somewhat more subtle, uh, a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, there's a young fella who is one of the co-founders of the National Sikh Youth Federation in Britain, um, uh, who tweeted uh, a year or two ago, well, you know, in English, we call him Terry Malevsky, but in P Punjabi, we say Lala Jagat Narain. Yeah. And that was written I... in Gurmukhi. That was written in Gurmukhi script. So, that it, you know, if you didn't know how to read that, you didn't know what this tweet was all about. But if you did know. Yeah. And you knew who Narain was. Yeah. Then you figured it out because, of course, in case in the unlikely event that any of your audience don't already know, Narain was a very well-known editor, politician, journalist, uh, who was uh, murdered by a couple of goons uh, who shot him to death in 1981, I guess. Um, long before Blue Star, all of that, um, of course. And it was a very famous case. And of course, B Bindranwali, the alleged patron saint of Khalistan, uh, was immediately the suspect because Narain had been going after him in public, yeah, uh, and, and and loudly and often, and he got death threats too, ignored it all, said the hell with you, I'm not afraid of you, and carried on, and of course they shot him dead, and uh, Bindranwali was arrested as the chief subject, uh, as a chief, uh, an obvious suspect, and then there was a plane hijacking, you may recall. Uh, after which uh, they worked it out and uh, Bindran Rali was never prosecuted. Uh, and um, the hijackers, in other words, achieved their object. So I would say there's been an evolution uh, in uh, the sophistication and complexity of the death threats. But uh, as I say, in my case, you know, like you'd have to be pretty stupid because you would be in if you're a Khalistani, you'd be an immediate suspect of any attack on me. And uh, others uh, suffer much worse who are more obscure and don't have the advantage of having been on television every night uh, for 40 years. Yeah. Asa, uh, the Khalistanis globally majority treat uh, Jarnal Singh Bhindranwale, their hero and their role model. But in reality, if you see, according to many experts, uh, Bhindranwale never ever advocated for a separate nation called Khalistan. If we see the uh, you know majority of his speeches or if you refer to many of the experts, he never advocated for Khalistan. So, I mean, I don't understand, like, where is it coming from? So what is your analysis? Well, that, that, that's an interesting question because um, a lot of people do assume that, well, you know, Bindran Wali equals Khalistani. And he's been treated that way by his followers who don't seem to be particularly interested in facts on any front. I mean, they just say whatever they want to say. So it suits them to turn him into uh, the patron saint of Khalistan, as I say. But I think you're correct in your analysis. Um, I've looked at his speeches quite closely and spoken to people who interviewed him and met him at that time. More commonly, uh, it wasn't that he was completely hands off, the notion of Khalistan. That just wasn't his thing. He wasn't touring Punjab in his busload of gunmen saying, we are fighting for Khalistan. He was fighting against Hindus and for the purity of his religion, Sikhism. And he was a religious fundamentalist. For example, uh, he was asked, you know, what, what, what do you think about the idea of an independent state called Khalistan? And he said, well, if they give it to us, I'll take it. Okay, well, it's not very enthusiastic, is it? It's, you know, it's a long way. It's not rejecting it. But he was strategic about this. That wasn't his main thing. Immediately, what would happen is, I'm um, quoting, for example, uh, Ujol de Sange's book, who did meet and challenge Ben Runwali on the roof of the Langa Hall uh, in Amritsar at the Golden Temple at the time. And it, well, it must have been the beginning of 84. And uh, he tackled him on this. What, you know, what, what about this Khalistan thing? 
Bindu Riley changed the subject. He wanted to talk about one most important thing, kept coming back to it, Dessange had cut his hair. Dessange's hair, that was the big thing. And then he changed the subject again and rail against alcohol and tobacco. So he was a religious Puritan, a religious fundamentalist, principally, raving on about anyone cutting their hair. Oh, he couldn't, you know, he, he just about threatened to, to kill Dessange on the spot because he had cut his hair. And uh, that's not uh, the popular image of a Khalistani. He was, that was thrust upon him after his death in 84. Yeah, and if even if you look at the speeches of his uh, close if, of his generals like uh, Major General Shabek Singh or uh, Bhai Amrik Singh, they also never advocated for Khalistan because I I am yet to find any speech of Brindan Wale or Shabek Singh or you know Bhai Amrik Singh where uh, you know they are advocating uh, for Khalistan per se. Yeah, that that that, that was a later accretion. It was it was uh, it, it came principally from again from the diaspora. People who had left or, or, or fled the police, Parmar is an example. He was wanted for murder in, in India way back in 1982 when the Indian government tried to extradite him from Canada and Canada declined, refused to extradite him. Uh, that's a whole other story. But the point is that it was from the diaspora that this idea grew up. It's you know it's easy to sell. We deserve our our own independent state. We were deprived by partition. Uh, we were cheated of our right, and uh, we're going to fight for that right. Well, um, for some reason, uh, millions of Sikhs in Punjab uh, don't see it that way. Uh, they regard themselves as as Indians, uh, and they don't particularly uh, like the idea of some sort of uh, theocracy dominated by the fanatics, the Galistanis, who are going around threatening people who cut their hair, uh, threatening people who don't follow their orders. Uh, and a lot of people living in Punjab don't want to live in such a state, particularly since if Khalistan were ever to come into force, it would be at daggers drawn with the government of India, with Pakistan on one side, India on the other, it would become a client of Pakistan. Have you noticed how Sikhs are treated in Pakistan? I mean, they supported the Khalistan movement for their own strategic reasons, not because they're yearning for the Sikhs to breathe free. And Pakistan stands for the freedom of the Sikhs. No, Pakistan stands for Pakistan, for their own strategic interests in cutting off India's land access to Kashmir by creating this Khalistan, a client state torn off from India to get revenge for the 1971 war in which Bangladesh was torn off from Pakistan. Well, all that ancient history is not so ancient. If you live in Punjab today, you remember what happened in the 1980s and the early 90s at the height of the Sikh insurgency. And... Uh, You've got your own ideas of whether, whether an independent state would be a good idea, and most of them don't. I mean, if you look at the, at the voting figures in recent elections in the state of Punjab, what well, last year, I think, Samranjit Singh Man's little splinter group, uh, Sada A, the, the, the uh, splinter group of the Sharamani Akali Dal. Akali Dal, yeah. Yes. Uh, they, um, they got, what, 2.5% of the vote? I mean, that was a good year for them, too. They got 2.5% of the vote. The BJP, a Hindu nationalist party in a Sikh-majority state, got way more votes than the Sikh separatists. That tells you something. And the time before that, in 2017, they got 0.3% of the vote. I mean, nota, none of the above got more votes than the separatists. In other words, their support within Punjab has been microscopic, absolutely pitiful performance by separatists who've been free to run. I mean, as long as they don't advocate armed rebellion. So it's a soft option, easy to support, but they still get no support. That answers a lot of questions about uh, the devotion to an independent state of the Sikhs of Punjab. 
it's the Sikhs of the diaspora that have been uh, campaigning for this idea. And I, I have to say that the campaign, uh, as, although it's now, as I've already said, doing rather well in cyberspace, it's not doing so well in, re in reality. Yeah. Uh, so if you have to share an advice with the Indian government on how to tackle the issue of Khalistan globally, so what will be uh, your uh, piece of advice? Well, uh, they've already, I think, rejected uh, uh, my advice, probably wise, uh, because it's unconstitutional uh, uh, under the Indian constitution for the, for the national government to even countenance the uh, destruction of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of uh, India's borders that are sacrosanct. They, they can't do it. Even if I advise them to let the referendum happen, uh, which I do, uh, then it's unconstitutional. But I have to say, I'm, I'm not bound by the Indian constitution. Uh, it's okay by me uh, if the Sikhs have a peaceful vote. I'd rather have that than non-peaceful activities. I mean, Amrit Pal Singh taking his private militia to a police station on the outskirts of Amritsar, what, a month or so ago, yeah, uh, and, and intimidating and attacking the police station in order to spring one of their gunmen uh, from custody in the police station. This is a challenge, an armed challenge to the state's monopoly on the use of force. This is anarchy. This is a very serious matter. Uh, so I'd rather have a vote, frankly. Let them vote. And given what I said in my last answer about the pitiful performance, the lack of public support, even the, the, the microscopic level of support that they've been getting over recent years, recent decades, um, I say, let the Khalistanis have their referendum. That's my principal advice for what it's worth, which is not much. Let the, 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 the Khalistanis have their referendum and let them fail. Then you've won the argument. It, 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 it's over. Uh, I mean, it's, it, if you look at those figures and you're, you're worried, oh, we, we better not let them have a referendum because they might win. You know, hello? You know, have you done the math? I mean, wake up. There is no support there. Uh, and um, it would be an extremely embarrassing defeat if you just let them. They would be, as I put it, like the dog that caught the car. Let the dog chase the car, bark, 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 that's fine. But what if the dog caught the car? It's going to get run over. So this would be a disaster for the Khalistan movement if the Indian government had the courage to say, okay, go ahead, have your referendum. Let's have a vote and see what see what happens. Well, we more or less know what's going to happen. Yeah. You know, they're uh, going to fall flat on their face. And that's that's why they've been delayed. You know, this is referendum 2020, by the way. And you know, I know, yeah, COVID, and you know, it's not their fault, but it's, it seems to be dragging on, doesn't it? They don't ever seem to get a conclusion, nor do they ever produce verified numbers they have a vote and then they issue some publicity oh we had a vast turnout we had thousands and thousands of people turn how many thousands and wh where's the validation of these numbers where's the validation of the integrity of the vote uh i mean i've I, i've had emails from uh, this is a friend of mine who's a sick in london england for example say yeah i registered to vote I went online and, I, and they said, okay, name. And I put in Angelina Jolie. Be serious. He put in Angelina Jolie and uh, the computer came out, bing, congratulations. You're registered to vote. Have a nice day. <laughs> you know, I mean, they say, for example, that they've got an independent, non-partisan commission of international experts uh, who are going to validate the vote. Okay, so they have some voting in London. Never hear from the Independent Commission. Then they have a voting in Toronto. Never hear from the Independent Commission. They have voting in Geneva, in Australia. Never hear from the Independent Oh, we got a huge turnout. 40,000 people came out. They were lined up around the block. Uh, okay, so where is this Independent Commission that's going to come forward and say, okay, we checked that these people, you know, they weren't voting 10 times each. 
You know, we 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 checked their IDs. Uh, we know who they are, and this was a valid vote. I haven't heard a word to that effect, not yet. So I think uh, they're in trouble, and this is uh, this is a sign that their, their reticence and their reluctance to give us facts uh, and validation for the voting that's happened so far is a sign that you know they know, they know what the real level of support is. Uh, among the Sikhs of the world, not just the diaspora, but of the world. And if the Indian government let them do it, it would be a resounding failure for the Khalistan movement. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your time and for sharing your valuable thoughts. Uh, it was a pleasure hosting you on the board. And I would like to request the audience uh, you know, to check out the link in the description box below and do check out the book uh, Blood for Blood if you are uh, interested uh, in knowing more about this topic and uh, if you are interested in uh, having in gaining a more in-depth knowledge uh, on this particular issue. Thank you so much, sir, for your time once again. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank Bye you very now. much. Thank you.